Hi, this is Marie from Living Felt. In this tutorial, we are going to be making colorful and one-of-a-kind bookmarks and book corners. I love this project, one, because it's sweet and simple, two, it is a very beginner-friendly wet felting project, and three, you get to hand stitch, but four, they make great gifts for the readers and journalers in your life. This project is very beginner-friendly because we are going to be working with pre-felt that gives us a nice solid base, and then the topical design is anything you want. These bookmarks will be backed with colorful cardstock or plain craft if you like. There are so many ways to personalize them and I can't wait to show you how to make them. Here's a look at the supplies for our wet felting of bookmarks project. We're going to be working with our PFL pre-felt, but our PFM pre-felt will work just as well. We only need a single layer of that. Merino top, I've chosen 19 micron in some really soft, sweet colors. There's also some Merino silk blends in here. Embellishment fibers will be a lot of luster. We have dyed bamboo, tussa silk, and viscose for great sheen and squigglies. And for added texture, just play. I have hankies, hand-dyed hankies, some yarns that we might use, sorry silk waste, and wool nips. For our basic wet felting setup, I like to start with a towel on my table, some bubble wrap, and a layer of plastic. You'll also want a second layer of plastic for sandwiching your project and some mesh for wetting through. I keep this bowl here just to hold my wet stuff. Grab an extra towel because you'll need it since we're going to be working with water. We'll always use room temperature water for if we're using silk fabrics, but you can use hot if you're using 100% wool. We'll be using our olive oil soap, a ball broth to help us wet out, and I also like to use a sponge. For felting, we'll be using our hands. Sometimes I like to use a dowel for rolling, and you might also like to try a palm washboard. We start this project with a cut of pre-felt. My sheet is about 9 by 12. In this one, I'm using our PFL pre-felt in a single layer. You can also use our PFM pre-felt. This gives us a nice solid foundation on which to build our design and anything goes here. The fibers that you place on top can be any direction. Notice that we're going to create a very thin layer using merino tops and merino silk blends as our second layer. Cover the entire side of the pre-felt with the colors as you like in the wool and merino silk blends. It's okay sometimes to mix up the fibers and just jumble them up to create a little cloud. The pre-felt really is giving you the foundation layer of your fabric. Make sure and pay attention to the corners and don't leave them too thin. Now it's time for our design elements. We're going to be using all manner of shiny stuff. The first I'm working with is our bamboo top, and I like to just mix it up and plop it down in different places to mix up the colors. We're using sari silk wastes, which clump up and make a wonderful texture. Merino neps, which are like little bits of confetti. Silk hankies, which are Silky bits, shiny, clumpy, add texture. And rather than fight sorry silk waste or hankies, just cut them where you like so that they get small enough to work with. Have fun with your design layer, mix it up, create layers, and get it all so that you're really happy with the color combinations and textures. It's okay if some of your pre-felt is showing through, but try and cover it most of the way. Once it's all felted down, it's going to look amazing. So experiment. This is a great time to experiment with different methods and see what you like in the finished process. Keep in mind that ultimately we'll be cutting very small shapes. So you might want to have a lot going on in seemingly a small area so that later when we cut out our shapes, there's variegation within a small square or a narrow strip. Once you're happy with your design layer, it's time to wet felt. 
My water is room temperature and I like to swirl my soap in it to get the water a little bit soapy. Wet your project thoroughly so that you are adding in water and soap and pushing the air out. It's important to have all of the fibers wetted from the top through the bottom before we start agitating. I like to use the sponge to really press water and soap in, and it also helps me from putting too much water on the project. Our project should be uniformly flat, so use your hands to press as much air out as you can. Get all of the fibers laying down and flush. We rub through the mesh initially just to feel that everything is even and level. I'm rubbing very lightly and don't use too much hand pressure here. We just want to get everything laying down flat. Once your project is thoroughly wet, remove your mesh by peeling it back at a nice shallow angle and ensure that none of your design elements come off. Then we'll use our bottom layer of plastic to wrap any trailing fibers back over onto the face of our project. We won't be putting any design elements on the back. Then we'll put our second layer of plastic on top. It helps to add a little soap and water to the outside of the plastic so that when we rub and massage, our hands glide smoothly. Rub your project with your hands for at least five minutes. And if your hands are sticking to the plastic, just add more water. Massage evenly, rubbing in all directions. Using the palm washboard is an optional felting tool. At this stage, our project is very delicate, so don't use any pressure at all. Wherever you rub with that palm washboard, do it in equal segments. So if you go in circles, do circles across the whole face. Go up and down, across the whole face. Side to side, across the whole face. But make sure that you do the same agitation methodology or movements on the back side. Otherwise your project will shrink unevenly and you'll find wrinkles in it on the opposite side. So we're gonna call this side A and side B. Everything we do to side A or the design side, we will do to side B or the back side. This will ensure our project shrinks evenly. The palm washboard is not a requirement, but it's a handy tool. If you have one, you can give it a go. This is a small project, so I'll be using a small dowel to roll it up in. We will roll from all four edges of side A a hundred times. We use our rock and roll method, so we'll roll it up in our towel, rock and roll, giving it a quarter turn on its axis at each 25, and you'll see that our hands go from the middle to the outsides of the project with each segment of rolling. This ensures equal pressure along the length or width of the project as we're agitating. After each 100 rolls, pick your project up and give it a clockwise turn. Do 100 rolls from all four edges on side A and side B. After completing all of those rolls, we're gonna remove the bottom layer of plastic. I feel like when the project is sandwiched in plastic, it kind of holds a lot of things in place and we wanna really allow those fibers to start moving now. So remove at least one layer of plastic. The other layer I like to act as a barrier between the wood until the fibers are more felted together. Complete at least 100 more rolls from a short end and a long end on side A and side B. At 
and then evaluate your felt. Notice whether any design elements are shifting around, how stretchy is it? We definitely have more felting to do, so you can take it off the dowel now and roll it on itself. Removing the dowel is gonna help the fibers get even closer together. So continue rolling from each edge evenly on side A and side B. Once it feels like we have a good felt forming, then we move into a stage called fulling. And fulling is once we have felt, but we're just further shrinking and matting the fibers together. That's where the fiber really starts to get dense and you notice the shrinkage. So fulling is a continuation of the agitation, but your rolling and your pressure gets a little more aggressive. It's really important when making felt is to make good felt. In this case, we wanna be able to cut our fabric and have it hold its integrity. So we have two pieces of very similar handmade felt here, but one is finished and one is not. So with this piece, you can see that as we handle it, the fibers are still very delicate. We could actually pull off and the design elements if we wanted to. And if you rub it between your fingers, you can feel the layers shifting. That means we need to felt more if we can pull those fibers away. So if your fabric feels like this, you're probably at a good pre-felt stage. Although you started with a pre-felt, you added design elements, just keep rolling and felting. This piece is a great example of a finished piece of felt. It has integrity and strength. We can pinch at the fabric and it comes up as one piece of fabric. Design elements are not pulling off. That will be an exception with nips. Some nips will always come loose, but you can trap them down with topical fibers, especially hankies. But over here, our design elements are really staying in place and that's important. Also, we can stretch it and pull on it. It does have some stretch, but for the most part, it holds its shape. We can also rub our hands across the surface and we're not disturbing the design elements. So you want to take your felt this far so that you have a really nicely made felt. If you're not sure whether your felt is completely done, let it dry overnight and we'll share an evaluation with you after the pieces are dried. If it appears that your felt has not shrunk evenly on all the edges, it very well could be attributed to the design elements. More fiber in one spot or certain types of design elements will impact that shrinkage. For this project, I really wouldn't worry about it as long as you have a nice, strong felt. When we're first learning to felt, sometimes it's difficult to know whether a felt is done. And in fact, it is a very common question that we get. I always suggest letting your fiber dry overnight so that you can get a real idea of how far it's progressed once it's dry. These are two examples of felt that we worked here in the studio. This one is finished and now a complete felt that is very strong and durable. And this one is not finished. So I'd like to look at the differences between the two so you can evaluate the felt you're making in your studio. If we look here on this piece, we stopped felting before it was quite finished, and you can tell in a few ways. One, you can start to move some of the design elements around and see that they're not quite finished. Here, you can still see all of the hairs. They're really sitting on top of the felt, and if I wanted to, I could just pick them right off of the surface. In addition, if I were to do a pinch test now that it's dry between the fibers, I could actually pull these layers apart Part, and they're actually tenting away from each other, that means they're not one solid piece of fabric. We want these layers to completely migrate together before we continue working with the fabric and especially before we cut it because we want it to last a long time. So let's look at this piece over here. 
This piece of felt has been completely felted and is now finished into one solid piece of fabric. It also has been allowed to dry overnight. And if we go to move these design elements, they are staying in place. If we rough our hand across the surface, nothing is shifting. And if we try and pinch the layers apart, there are no layers to pinch apart. This is now one piece of fabric. So if you're not sure whether your felt is finished, just let it dry overnight, evaluate it once it's dry, and if it's not quite finished, go back and continue the felting process. Get it wet, add soap, you can even heat it up at this stage with hot water, and continue the fulling and felting. Once your piece is completely felted, rinse out all of the soap, and while you're cleaning up your workstation, put it in a bowl of water with just a teaspoon or two of vinegar for about 15 minutes. Then squeeze out all of the water or roll it in a towel and set it flat to dry overnight. Some projects really deserve a steam press, so you'll need an ironing mat and a steam iron. Here's a look at the tools we'll use to assemble our bookmarks and book corners. We'll be cutting on a rotary mat and using a straight edge. You'll want scissors for both fabric and paper, rotary cutters for fabric and paper. I like to use corner chompers. You might want to add some ribbons. We'll use embroidery floss. We will use a wow mat or some other mat to poke into. I like to use these little wonder clips, some basic needles for sewing and one that you can use to poke and some little scissors there. Paper, use scrapbook paper and or plain craft paper. Use the patterns provided to cut out the basic shapes and then cut those shapes out of your scrapbook paper or cardstock for your bookmarks and book corners. You can use the guide to round your corners or you can use a cropping tool like this one. To cut our felt, the first thing I like to do is to square up one edge. The bookmarks are 1.75 inches by seven inches long and the book corners are three inch by three inch square in this example. When you're cutting, don't overthink the designs. I think you'll find that once you clip this beautiful fabric into little pieces, every little bit looks amazing. Once you have your squares cut, then you can cut them on a diagonal for your book corners and cut your bookmarks to the seven inch length. Using the template provided, I first poke holes along all of the dots with a pin or needle. If your needle's too blunt, just start it with a straight pin first. Align your cardstock with that template and poke in all of those same holes. This will make stitching fast and easy on your fingers. It also ensures a really even blanket stitch as you go. Align your felt to the edge of the square and clamp it in place. You can then cut the corners to match the round. We're going to blanket stitch our edge and this is just my method. So first I'm gonna tie a knot and anchor the thread in the back of the felt. A full stitch there. I go through the first hole and then back up through the hole and up through the felt so that I know my stitch is in the correct place. Thread your needle back through that hole and come out the front again. Run your needle underneath the first stitch at the edge of the book corner. We're going to come up through the back in the second hole, but pull your thread down so that your needle comes up above it. Pull your thread straight through and then you're going to pull it perpendicular for a straight blanket stitch. Continue stitching along the edge. On the face, pull the thread down. On the back, go into the next hole and bring your needle above the thread. Pull the thread straight 
so that your blanket stitch aligns with the edge of your book corner. When we get to the corner, we're going to go through the corner hole three times. Once on the edge we've been stitching, once to get the corner diagonal, and wants to move to the next edge of the card. Continue stitching down this side. When we get to the end, I like to come back up through the bottom of the felt and tie a knot underneath the felt fabric. Stitch the bookmark in the same fashion, but if you decide to add a top loop or any other string or beadwork to the top of your bookmark, add it in before you begin your blanket stitch. These bookmarks look so cute. You know, you could write an inscription if you're gifting them to someone or maybe add a favorite quote to them. You could even pre-print them before you start, but they are ready to be put to use. I really hope you enjoyed this project. And if you make your own, please do share them with us on our Facebook group. If you're looking for more felting with pre-felt or beginner-friendly wet felting tutorials, check out this next video right here.